Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and today we're going to talk about an immunotherapy uh, for cancer treatment. Immunotherapy at one time was thought to be one of the most promising new breakthrough treatments for cancer and there are still a lot of people who believe that that's the case. It's also referred to bio as biologic therapy and so immunotherapy is the term used for any treatment that harnesses the immune system to fight disease and in this case we're going to talk about immunotherapy and cancer. Now chemotherapy kills cancer cells. The concept behind immunotherapy is to empower the body to attack the cancer cells on its own, ostensibly enabling the body to heal itself. And that sounds like a good idea, it actually is. The question is, does it work? So let's start with the different types of immuno immunotherapy. The most widely used is checkpoint inhibitors and how they work is they block a mechanism that allows cancer cells to escape immune surveillance. Checkpoint inhibitors allow natural killer cells to attack tumor cells and are approved to treat advanced melanoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lung, kidney, bladder, and head and neck cancers. And they're being tested for other cancers as well. Monoclonal antibodies are proteins designed to treat, uh, to target antigens or markers located on the surface of cancer cells. They then signal immune cells to go and attack those cancer cells. Monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies can also interfere with cell signaling, which can in turn block the growth of tumors. Adoptive cell transfer involves taking T cells from the patient, changing them in a lab in order to make them better able to attack the patient's cancer cells and then reinfusing them into the bloodstream. The T cells can be taken from the patient's tumor or they can be taken from the bloodstream and then genetically altered in order to attack cancer cells or even equipped with receptors that recognize and attack cancer cells. Cytokines, which are messenger molecules that help to control the growth and activity of the immune cells, can also be used to treat cancer. The two most commonly used cytokines, cytokines are interferons and interleukins. You may have heard these kinds of ter terms thrown around uh, in the media, that sort of thing. And what these do is help immune cells to grow and divide more quickly, thus, so theoretically, uh, increasing the immune response to cancer. Cancer vaccines are not used to prevent cancer, but rather to treat it by stimulating the immune system again to attack cancer cells by using fragments of mutated cells. They've mostly been unsuccessful. So I'm going to talk about these various therapies and how they've worked. I'm going to start with the cancer vaccines and then we'll work backwards through some others. Provenge is a vaccine that was developed to target prostate cancer. And the story of Provenge involves several things. It's one of the most egregious failures of both immunotherapy and also the federal regulation that should be going on to uh, protect patients. It, it's an exhibit of what a failure it has actually been. The therapy costs $93,000 a year. That's quite a lot of money. 7,000 of which is earned by the prescribing oncologist in the form of a profit or commission, depending on how you want to look at it. The drug is custom manufactured from each patient's cells, which is part of why it is so expensive, which wouldn't be a problem if it actually worked. Dendrion is the company that makes it, applied for FDA approval for Provenge in 2007, and in response to uh, a hearing, the company was told that more data were needed in order to grant it. Um, patient advocacy groups, which are one of the drug company's favorite thing to, to invest in, they, they fund these patient advocacy groups and then they get them all ginned up to protest and scream and holler so that they put pressure on the FDA and on Congress to do the drug company's bidding. But anyway, the advocacy groups were monetized and protested and they cited that there were significant conflicts of interest with two of the people who were on the, the review board for Provenge who voted no. Now, it actually was true. The two who they were complaining about, the two panel members, were a husband and wife team who between them had contacts and associations with about 12 different drug companies, a couple of which uh, were manufacturing competing products. So there actually was a conflict of interest and that shouldn't be going on. But in this case, the two researchers or review board uh, members happened to be very right. So Prevenge was finally approved in 2010 because almost everything that gets in front of the FDA is eventually approved, after which a very interesting thing happens. Now, what, when you think about this, when a drug is approved to treat a disease that is supposed to be pretty common, the stock should go up. I mean, the people who are investors should be excited. Well, in this case, the drug was approved and the Dendrion Insider sold all of their stock. Now, why was this? 
Well, a financial analyst who would be the type of person who would be curious about this, her name was Marie Huber, uh, she became curious and conducted her own investigation and she discovered something interesting and that was that the company had changed the endpoints and the enrollment criteria in clinical trials. And the first trial, which was the one that led the FDA to deny approval, the endpoint used was time to progression, how long it takes the cancer to start growing again. And this trial showed that the vaccine didn't work at all. In the second trial, the endpoint was survival, and Provenge did work. Well, how could a drug extend life if it doesn't uh, delay tumor progression? Well, according to Huber and what she found out, the men in the placebo group received 20 billion fewer white cells than the men in the treatment group, and more of them were dead or dying cells. Well, if you infuse dead or dying cells in the bloodstream, you increase inflammation, which stimulates the growth of cancer cells. Huber says that the FDA will not respond to her request for more information. Now, one of Dendrion's paid consultants, Donald Berry, who's a medical doctor at MD Anderson Cancer Center, he is a lot more talkative about the whole thing, and here's what he has to say, and this is a direct quote. The control group's placebo vaccine used in impact in the predecessor trial had never been used anywhere for anything and may well have been detrimental to patients. Here's a great way to get your drug approved. Kill the control patients. I mean, seriously, that's pretty amazing, yes? Well, another vaccine developed in Cuba has been getting a lot of attention lately. It's for lung cancer, and it was recently approved by the FDA for a U.S. clinical trial. Simvax is the name of it. It's designed to treat non-small cell lung cancer and was introduced to the Cuban market in 2011. The U.S. trial will involve a combination of this vaccine and another checkpoint inhibitor and will be conducted at Roswell Park, which has a very interesting history. It's a powerful research, uh, cancer research center that played a major role in deceiving the public about the efficacy of PSA testing for early detection of prostate cancer. So when I found out that Roswell Park was going to be involved in this, I thought that is just perfect if you're trying to deceive the public because they're very good at it. A Fox News station in Chicago reported that uh, about this Simvax, quote, it's a medical breakthrough that could literally save millions of lives. And it, quote, this news station quoted Dr. Santosh Rao of MD Anderson Cancer Center as saying, quote, that the vaccine has been shown to significantly increase life expectancy and is, quote, cheap and seems to be effective for a lot of patients. So I did a little checking, and here's what this, it turns out to be. Uh, all these comments are medical speak for hardly worth talking about in real terms. A recent phase three trial showed that patients who are vaccinated lived an average of 12.43 months compared to 9.43 months for the patients who weren't vaccinated. Um, in what universe is an extra three months of life, um, you know, a breakthrough medical treatment? I mean, I don't think most cancer patients would think that three extra months of life is what they're looking for. But of course, this won't be disclosed to the patients and the vaccine will be promoted as a breakthrough. People will be told they're lucky to have access to it and et cetera, and et cetera, right? The success rate overall for immunotherapy in terms of extending life, not really very good. Between 20 and 40% of patients uh, benefit from checkpoint inhibitors, and cell therapy is usually a very short-term benefit of temporary remission at best. Here's the problem, though. The side effects are serious, and they include autoimmune disease, which is then treated with steroids. Cell therapy can be fatal, meaning that the treatment may kill the patient before the cancer does. Many patients spend much of their treatment time in the ICU. The problem with immunotherapy is the mechanism of action that supposedly makes the therapies effective can also result in an overstimulated immune system that starts attacking healthy parts of the body. And these autoimmune responses can be fatal if organs like the heart end up being the target. In fact, severe reactions occur about 20% of the time when one drug is used and in over 50% of the patients when more than one drug is used. A study in which 496 patients received immunotherapy treatment resulted in 242 side effects in 138 patients. 25% of those were severe, life-threatening, or requiring hospitalization. Several patients have died due to the therapy, not the cancer. One oncologist thinks that we really should be exercising more caution. I mean, you think? Dr. John Timmerman at UCLA reported to the New York Times that one of his patients died after receiving immunotherapy. The treatment got rid of the cancer, but shortly after she developed flu-like symptoms and uh, she ended up in the emergency room and she died as a result of an inflammatory response to the drugs. According to Timmerman, her immune system went into overdrive and killed her. 
Timmerman also said that doctors and consumers have been told that uh, immunotherapy is a miraculous treatment that can save lives, but they really haven't been told much about what can go wrong. Well, almost everyone agrees that more research is needed. And the problem is that in spite of lack of research, immunotherapy is already a big business, and of course it's being promoted as a breakthrough treatment. Some of the drugs cost over 250000 and a drug combo that's currently in research uh, is expected to cost over $1 million per year. Leonard Saltz, a medical doctor from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, says this makes some cancer uh, treatments more expensive than gold, which is completely unsustainable. And, and you wouldn't even mind, if, if there was a million dollar treatment that let patients live 10 years longer, I think we'd all agree, this is a good thing, we'd have no problem with it, but we're talking about three months of life and you might die of the treatment instead of um, uh, survive and thrive. The problem is, fees like these are powerful incentives to ignore dangerous side effects and to just plow ahead, and that's what's going on. Instead of questioning the wisdom of immunotherapy, doctors claim that immune, autoimmune disease caused by cancer treatment can just be treated with steroids. But the side effects of steroids are also quite serious, and they include things like severe allergic reactions, increased hunger and weight gain, chest pain, easy bruising, infection, changes in vision, vomiting, and seizures. This is a short list, and it's one of the reasons why steroids are usually prescribed for as short a time as possible, and often followed by even stronger drugs for autoimmune that are even more serious, with, uh, that have even more serious side effects uh, like chemotherapy. One of the most concerning side effects of immunotherapy is the development of type 1 diabetes. There are several reports of patients suddenly going into diabetic ketoacidosis, which can cause permanent harm to organs and is sometimes fatal. One of the major issues is that most doctors don't know the side effects of immunotherapy, which means they can't possibly engage in an informed discussion about risks and benefits with their patients or warn them to watch for signs of serious things like the onset of diabetes. What's happened with immunotherapy is a very common problem in medicine, and it goes like this. A researcher or a group of researchers develop an idea that could be an innovative solution to a very serious condition like cancer. Researchers begin to investigate the hypothesis, and at the first sign of any success whatsoever, uh, however small it may be and without any idea of what the side effects might be, um, the, side, the hypothesis is now suddenly converted to being called a treatment. Instead of cautious optimism, doctors jump off the cliff and start, start telling their uh, patients about this new treatment, what a breakthrough it is, uh, dutifully reporting the benefits in relative instead of absolute terms. And just by way of example, the aforementioned, the aforementioned three additional months of life and, uh, with that uh, vaccine that I was talking about, that gets reported as 33% increased survival, which sounds a whole lot better than three extra months of life. Makes the patient feel really encouraged. By the time it's discovered that the treatments, and I, I would put air quotes around that, I mean, who are we fooling? here are marginally useful, I'm being kind here, the side effects are heinous and even life-threatening, the treatments are now widely used and considered the standard of care, I've always said once the horse is out of the barn it's almost impossible to rein it back in, and hence we have the current state of health care which is ridiculously expensive stuff with ridiculously low efficacy rates being prescribed in ridiculous, for ridiculous numbers of people. And so um, this is why consumers, I mean, immunotherapy is the poster child for why informed medical decision making is so important. If the consumer doesn't know, um, the chance that the doctor is going to tell that person or, or even knows himself or herself so small, so the consumer has to know. The consumer is the one who has to say no. We're not going to clean up this mess within medical institutions. All right, well, that's all for today. Actually, all for the week. So as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.